Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with the man, the myth, and a real legend in the game. From the juniors all the way up until now, he's one of the most well-respected players on tour. He's got an infectious smile. And you think Nick Kyrgios is exciting to watch now? This dude was the first of that entertainment generation. <laughs> Marcos is welcome, brother. Hey, Kamal, how are you, man? Thanks for the nice words. Man, you, you are a legend with the hair. You know, I was talking to Pat Cash a few months ago, and he talked about he was the first one to take the bandana off and throw it in the stands, right? And yeah. then you, Grigor, you know, uh, Rublev, now that's like a thing. But, like, he was the guy that started it, right? Yeah. yeah. He, but you I mean, for your hair, and after the match, you know, you had, they used to say you had the best hair on tour. I don't know if you know that. I never heard that. Yeah. <laughs> it's the first time I, I hear that. But, yeah, thanks. And talking about Pat, I, I, I hope, yeah, I learned a lot from him. Uh, actually, his book was the first one I, I ever read, was the first book I ever read in my life, was his book. So Really? It, it's funny that, yeah, you, you come up with his name. <laughs> oh, man. But well, well, now, if you catch him at the bar, he's got more stories that probably can't fit in the book from COVID to conspiracy theory. I mean, the dude's brain is like something else. Yeah, a great guy. I met him a couple of times. We played some uh, uh, Indian leagues together. Great guy, great person. So now, man, you are in your next, your next chapter, right? Where you're running the IMG Future Stars Tour there in Athens, Greece. And to me, you're perfect for it because your junior career was legendary, right? I mean, you had the typical career where you grow up in a small island, needed to move to go get better competition. How did you get into this new junior tour and what was the, what was the motivation behind it? Yeah, I, I definitely my motivation always, uh, you know, since I retired, I, I wanna somehow give back to, to you know, kids that, uh, that are in need, that don't have, you know, big federations. And, and I think this is a great way, you know, and. Uh, you know, uh, help not only the, the, the kids, but also the, their team, their parents, uh, their coaches, you know, uh, you know, make them, not make them understand, but, you know, show them with my experience and my knowledge with all these years that I went through uh, as a young kid, because I left home when I was 14 uh, to France, you know, just to guide them a bit, give them some kind of advice to uh, you know, to, to, to make them understand at a very young age what it is and what you have to go through and the difficulties of becoming a professional, professional uh, tennis player. And uh, I, I think I, IMG has done a fantastic job to, to put this tournament together. And it's, uh, it's actually a big pleasure for me to, to be able to be part of it as a tournament director. So we talk about these, these, these young kids and their teams. Your dad is a famous tennis dad. And one of his famous words was, we grew up on a small island. In order for Marcos to get good, we had to go get competition off the island. Tell me, tell me what that was like to have to leave home at 14 and move to Paris to travel. Was it like, yes, I get to go? Or was it like, oh, shit, I don't want to go? Uh, it was it was a bit of both, <laughs> actually. You know, I wanted to leave because you know, since I'm a kid, I, I was a kid. My my brothers play tennis. Uh, my older brothers play tennis, Marinos and Petros, and and uh, you know, they kind of put it put in my mind that uh, you know I'm gonna become a professional uh, tennis player and that I'm gonna leave one day from from Cyprus at a young age and and uh, pursue my my dream and. Uh, and yeah, I, I wanted to go, but once I got there, that's where the difficult part was. You know, <laughs> I mean, the, f the first four or five months were honestly were, you know, uh, very difficult, crying every night uh, in bed. You know, uh, it wasn't academies back then wasn't what it is now. You know, you didn't have dorms, you didn't have schools. Uh, I had to I have to I had to stay in a family uh, which was uh, uh, allocated like an hour and a half away from the academy. So I had to take the subway alone every morning, uh, and, uh, and it was it was really tough, you know. And after training to get the subway back home, 
you know, you miss your friends, you miss your family. Uh, but, you know, I had a goal and uh, I had a dream and uh, it was to, you know, to play Grand Slam um, a main draw. And uh, yeah, I, I've done a bit better than Grand Slam main draw. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this, because, you know, I got an academy in Chicago and I always, you know, tell people it's tricky. You know, in America, they, everybody moves to Florida, right? But I always say, you don't really move to Florida to get good. You move to Florida to get competition, right? Mm -hmm. By the time you end up at an academy, you need to be able to kind of hit the ball already, right? And you're going there for a specific purpose. When you left Cyprus, were you already balling at the time or did you need to actually go and learn the game, right? Or did you just need to go and get more competition? I needed more competition. Definitely, I needed more fitness. Uh, my weakness was always a fitness part. You know, I, I, here in Cyprus back then, we didn't have the, the fitness part uh, really well. I, I think technique-wise, I was, I was pretty okay as a young kid. I was pretty... I, I, I could feel things. I could feel the ball. I loved playing the game. You know, I, I, you know, I, could, be, I could do a lot of things on the court. Uh, and, uh, of course, I needed to work on my game too. But my main my main uh, main thing that changed was when i started you know working a lot on my fitness and also having to compete you know with with the same level players every day which is very important you know here in cyprus at one moment i was i was kind of the best at 14 years old i was number 1 in the men's category uh, in cyprus so i had to go somewhere and um, i went to the academy bobret in Paris back then it was a Bob Rett Academy and uh, yeah Bob Rett I mean great great legend coach coached so many players and, and was there you know he guided me through a lot of things and uh, helped me develop very fast and understand uh, kind of how to take responsibility in the work I've done I, I, I have to do on the court and uh, uh, he was a great mentor for me and uh, yeah, and uh, of course, the competition and, and the fitness was very important for me, too. So when you have this tournament coming up right, with the 12s, what will be your message, right? You're going to probably have, you know, 64 of the best kids, right, from across the country. What are you going to look for, not only just the winner, because sometimes the best player or the best talent doesn't end up winning the tournament, right, at 12 years old. So what in your mind is going to be like the differentiator between these 12 year olds? First of all, I mean, the message I want to give out to these young kids, talent without work is nothing. And, and I think that's very important. And uh, for me, uh, it's, it's to make them understand, I mean, make them understand, let's say that every day is a learning process. Uh, it doesn't matter if you win today the tournament, one of the best tournaments under 12. You know, if you want to become a professional tennis player, you, you, need to, you need to plan, you need to sacrifice, you need self-discipline, and you need to work hard. And for me, those are, are, are very important things that the earlier you understand them, which I was lucky to understand at a very young age, the better it is for you. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a big message that I, I you know, uh, as as Marcos, as a person, I want to give back to to the young kids. Uh, of course, there are other, you know, technique, different issues. Everybody has, you know, his own his own uh, you know story to write and the way he wants to write it. But you know, it's just to 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 help every individual as as much as I can to to achieve their dreams. So. Out of all you just said, the thing that just popped out of me is self-discipline. Yes. When I think about this sport, right, A, financially it's expensive. So mm -hmm. you can't only be improving when someone's on the court telling you to improve, right? You got to be like grab a basket of balls and go serve. You know what I mean? You got to be sort of self-disciplined and police yourself, especially when you start transitioning for the tour. So you won the Junior Australian Open. Right. And again, this is like why you're the perfect person for this. You got Songa, Monfils, all these people sort of in that class of juniors at the time. Tell me what that was like, because, you know, I think when I think about kids, I think we all say we want it and we all like maybe think we can do it, but you never really know. Right. And the few, very few people actually believe the stuff that they say. Right. So when you won the Australian Open, was it like, oh, 
it, man. I knew I could do it. It wasn't like, whoa, how did this happen? I think when you, you set a goal and you believe it, like, I mean, I did with my team back then, to win the Australian Open or to win a Grand Slam Junior was a goal. And if you don't, I mean, if, if you go there and you win it and you're surprised, then it means you kind of didn't believe it. It was like something. So uh, I, 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 what I said after the Australian Open was, uh, when I won the juniors was, this feels good, you know? I want more of this feeling. <laughs> I, I, I want, you know, I want to do the same in the seniors. And, and I always wanted more. I, I always wanted something as a junior when I'm, what I'm saying, it was every day I was going to a, a new tournament, a new event. Uh, going into the seniors, everything was new. I wanted to learn. I wanted to improve. And, uh, and uh, for me, that's very important. You know, every day to, like you said, to have the self-discipline to to want to do even better and want to improve and want, want more is, is, is very important. So we're talking, we see a lot of people have great junior careers, right? And sort of struggle with the transition to the tour. You know what I mean? People win the junior slam, people number one in the world on the juniors, but they don't necessarily become number world, number one in the world on tour. When you were making that transition, obviously you had two U.S. Open junior finals, Australian Open champion. Who was the first person on the senior tour to just whoop you so bad it made you think like, damn, this is a different level? Uh, Andragas. Yeah. Yeah, I practiced with him uh, 2005 at the US Open. We just, you know, I just practiced with him like an hour and a half. We booked the court together. And, uh, you know, I feed the ball, first ball. The guy is just killing the ball. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I need, you know, Warm up. I wanna, yeah, I want to feel something, you know, like the ball was coming so fast. I, and then I, I get the rhythm, you know, I start to move faster, get the rhythm, you know, my, my heartbeat's going up because, you know, the, the intensity is much higher. And then we have a drink and then I go to the net. First volley, I, I feed the ball and again, he smacks it at me. And I'm like, whoa, I mean, like, this is a way, yeah, but I learned a lot because it made me think this is the intensity that I have to put in every ball. We're talking about Andre Agassi here. He, for me, he was my idol. So I, I was even scared going into the court with him. And, and, and that, you know, that gave me a small idea, a small click in my head that, Marcos, I mean, this is an example for you. And this is, this is, it was something new. Like I said, it's something, and you were looking all the time about small things that, that but this stayed always in my mind. And, and uh, yeah, Andre helped me tremendously that day without even you know saying a word but but yeah I just you know I was eager to to learn and and I learned that from that from him and then all, all of a sudden end of the year I played finals in Basel and the next year I play I play uh the finals of Australian Open so I, I think that was a big part of you know of, of of my learning step is just practicing an hour and a half with Andre you know it's funny so I look at like Andre, P, Federer, Novak. And I would say that none of those players are very vocal mentors. Like they're not going to grab a player and sit them down and take you to dinner and talk to you about it. But when you have an opportunity to practice with them, they're teaching you a lesson. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like very purposefully, they're kind of like, this kid can play, he has potential. I'm going to show, I'm going to teach him a lesson today, right? I'm going to give him something that he needs. Do you feel that, is, is that accurate? Like, do you see that with Rafa and those guys where it's like they're mentoring without even saying a word? That's, I, I think that's exactly it. And that's what, like, I described a bit my practice with Andre, but that was it. It was without saying a word, the guy just showed me what I need to do. And it, it's up to, it's up to you to, to be smart enough to take that, <laughs> that you know, that lesson, like that beating and, and, and take it into positive and, and, and you know, and, and kind of uh, criticize a bit yourself. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's very important. And um, 
and it comes back to the you know every day you can learn something every every day every single day every time you step on a court you know you have to be open minded and and be able to you know be like a like a sponge you know that takes information without anybody telling you but seeing things and 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 it's very important and i think i was i was really really good at that so you talk about seeing things right so you've had I mean, tremendous career over a long period of time, right? From junior to pros, Chillet, Songa, Agassi, Sampras, Federer, <laughs> even young boys like Berrettini, right? You've crossed so many generations. Build your perfect player. Cause now you're building, right? Now you're like, got the juniors about to come. Now yeah. you're like gonna be giving them wisdom. You looking for like build your perfect player out of the guys you played against. Definitely. I mean, the serve, it's either, I, I would go with Isner instead of Karlovic. Of course, of, uh, Isner has more variety for me. He has a kick serve. Um, um, then forehand, I would go, I would go with Federer, not because it's the hardest or the, the, the fastest, sorry. It's, 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 it's how early he takes it and how it disguises his movement. You you don't see where where the ball you know where you don't read it so easily. Let's say on on the um, on the backhand side, I would go with Novak Djokovic for sure. Return Novak Djokovic uh, puts a lot of pressure uh, that back and down the line of Novak. It's you know it's a killer uh, volleys. Of all is, I would go again with with Roger Federer. I think pretty pretty solid. And then what's left? Um, uh, attitude, movement. Uh, let's go with attitude. I love Rafa's attitude. Yeah, I think yeah, I think the guys for me the best, the best in everything. You never see him complaining. He, you know, he's all the time there fighting, not throwing rackets. You know, is is so stable, so such a professional, such a a class act on the court, and um, and movement. Yeah, I would. Yeah, it's 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 tough because there is a lot of players, but I would go maybe with Gael Monfils for that yeah. uh, because of you know his stretch and he he covers the court amazingly good, and uh, yeah, I guess that's about it from. From the tennis side. That's perfect. Yeah, I was I was waiting on Guy from the movement and <laughs> Rafa from just the intensity, the attitude. Um, so let me ask you this: Who is the best player you know, besides you know, to never win a slam? I mean, I always think back to like Guy Monfils playing Federer at the French Open. <clears throat> yeah. And to me, like that was like his time in the semis, right? He lost. Yeah. In the semis. It was two sets to love up or something. Two sets of love up and like five match points. And it was like, that was like his time. And I don't know that he ever fully, fully recovered from that. So who, who's the best, maybe even talent, like best player, you know, never to win a slam. I, th I think it's a very difficult question because of the three, even four with Andy Murray. Yeah. Uh, in my time, uh, I, 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 I think it was to to win a Grand Slam. You had to beat one, maybe two of those guys, <laughs> and and I think that's. I mean, there there is people that did it, of course, but I think there were very ta a lot of talented players that could have won a Grand Slam. We see Tsonga, like you said, Monfils, Nishikori had mm. his chance against Chilic, but Chilic took it. Ah, there is many. I mean, Ferrer, a guy like Ferrer, I mean, could have won a Grand Slam. Burdich, mm. uh, we're talking about a lot of players that could won a Grand Slam but didn't because of, of, the, of those four guys who, who were dominating. Uh, okay, the three were dominating in Grand Slams. Andy played so many, Andy Murray played so many, so many finals. But so uh, it's a difficult question. I think there is a lot of them. And, mm. and still now you see. You see, last year there's so many talented guys like Zverev, Tsitsipas, and they cannot go through a Djokovic still. And now we see Rafa. I mean, Djokovic's not playing. Rafa comes back, and Rafa wins, wins the Australian Open. So 
uh, you, you can imagine the level these guys are. It's just just a joke. And you see now without them at Miami, how it's wide open, right? Yes. Like if they're uh, not yes. at the tournament, there's probably it's ten cool. guys that can win. Exactly. Exactly. So and, yeah, and I'm I'm looking forward to that though, because you know for a while it's kind of like all right, one of these three guys. I, who's on the same side? Is it Rafa and Fed on the same side? Is it Novak and Fed on the same side? Whoever makes it off this side is going to win, right? But now, without those three, right, sort of in the draw, mm-hmm. um, I mean, everything's it open. Be, it's could wide be, open. Yeah, it could be eight or ten guys, definitely. Uh, I mean, able to win a Grand Slam. <laughs> so, <coughs> you did a stint where you were coaching for a while. Mm-hmm. Tell me about how that was. Very little while. Very little while. <laughs> yeah. so tell me about how it came to be and what that experience was like. Because I, you know, coaching for my for me is a passion, right? I love coaching, but it's a challenge, right? Because especially at this at this level, you're not in full control. You're kind of working for the player. The player's the boss, but you're trying to boss them around and work with them and help them. But at the end of the day, they can say, you know what, go f- off, right? Yeah. So. Tell me about that little brief coaching stint. I, I loved it. I, I loved, I mean, first of all, I, I was lucky enough to train with Elena, which is an unbelievable girl, uh, you know, uh, Gael also in the team. And, uh, you know, it was, it was. Uh, I mean, very, I, I did like 15 days of off season with, with them because we kind of decided it late and then, went to Australia with them and it was lovely. Unfortunately, COVID came and, you know, with three kids, it was very difficult for me to travel anymore and I needed to schedule and it was very difficult to have a schedule during the COVID times. But yeah, I just, I, I loved it and uh, I would uh, I would love to, you know, try it again or do it again. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot, you know, uh, how to, because I think it's important you, you, you control your emotions. <laughs> <laughs> and not <laughs> you're laughing so you you know what i mean right so <laughs> so yeah it's, it's important to to control the emotions i think it's something different it's something that you know as a person i want to improve in that of course and the more you go through it the more you improve of course but uh, yeah i just would love to do it again because it's something that that motivates me and something that i love and of course, you know, working with a player, helping him, uh, it's, it's, impor- it's, it's something important for the next chapter of my life. It's funny you mentioned, and this is like a sign of a good coach, right? You, you mentioned the need to improve even as a coach. And like now, I look back, and I've been coaching since I was 17 years old, right? I look back at my 17-year-old self and was like, damn, I sucked. You know what I mean? Like yeah. 42 now, but you're like, man, 10 years ago, I sucked as a coach. Like, I wasn't that good. You know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't really, you know, was, you know, talking too much or not talking enough or not yeah. speaking at the right time or not, you know, I was like, wow. It's like, you really sort of evolve, right? Yeah. You had the chance to work with Patrick back when he was first starting. Um, how would you rate Patrick then versus now? Uh, it's tough because Patrick, I, I mean, you know, he wasn't actually my coach coach he right. was never my coach coach i had always a coach with me who traveled with me you know when when the i was just at the academy uh, patrick would you know be there uh, i i worked with patrick let's say maybe two or three weeks throughout my career in some tournaments when my coach couldn't come or you know uh, family issues and that so uh, but, uh, you know, I think he evolved a lot. I think he's doing great things for, for tennis, for young kids. And uh, he has a very good, uh, you know, he has a very good marketing team that, you know, does very good in the marketing. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, he he also must have improved a lot. I didn't speak to him for a long time. And, uh, yeah, I, I, from what I see, I mean, he's having great players next to him and, you uh, uh, you know, he, he's becoming uh, the coach he wants. Uh, he wanted always to be. So, I got three kids, right? Daughter, two boys. Uh, I did. I did a talk with Macy, and you know, you think about all these great coaches, 
and great players whose kids don't play, right? And I always say my kids are kind of like, eh, I don't want to play, right? Because I think it takes daddy away, right? Tennis takes daddy away, and I got to watch him on the TV when I want him here, right? Um, do your kids play? Yeah, I mean, they do because they have to. <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, they right. do. I mean, my, <laughs> my older daughter does. Uh, she plays four times a week. Uh, but, you know, it's just for fun. Uh, we want me and Carolina, my wife, we want them to just play for fun. It's something that, you know, runs in the family. And, uh, you know, uh, she, uh, she was playing as, uh, when she was younger. She stopped for a while and then she asked us, to play again, which was very positive. So we are not pushing her. It's something that she, she wants to, to do. And like you said, but she doesn't want us to be next to her when she's playing. So, you know, we, we just let her take her to the club. She plays with her coach. We have a coffee and we go home. And, <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, I, you know, we just, you know, the, the taxi driver taking them there and, and coming back home. So. So yeah, they're the most important thing for me for my kids to, to to enjoy what they do, to have fun, and I mean, to tomorrow they tell me they want to be a professional tennis player, you know, I would make them think twice, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I would make them think twice, definitely. <laughs> so let's talk about thinking twice, right? So you've been, I mean, all the levels from juniors to you know to the tour. Give me your favorite stop and your and, and one place where you like, eh. I never got to go back there. Oh. Yeah, there is some, you know, futures in in Uzbekistan. I mean, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I have nothing against Uzbekistan, but you know, there were tough moments where, you know, you, you had to travel to places, you know, and uh, uh, you know, get through. And also coming from Cyprus, you know, I didn't have the um, red flight. Uh, yeah, I mean the right uh, right flag to to get some wild cards and you know to to get a, an easy access to to ATP tournaments. Uh, I remember in two thousand three, I I I when I finished number one junior, I also finished top two hundred in the ATP. So I, I, I that year I think I played more than a hundred matches. Uh, so yeah, and was traveling to futures around you know around the world if it was. <laughs> And I remember one, one time I had to travel from Uzbekistan because I got in last minute in the qualies of US Open. So I had to travel. I played the finals. So I had to travel on Monday. I arrived in, in uh, the States on Monday night and I had to play against Steve Sarovich on Tuesday. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it was like, yeah. So I, I think it was, I mean, those, you know, those small tournaments where you, you had to grind and everything, but I'm saying now that I wouldn't want to go back, but at the end of the day, you know what? I learned so much from those countries, so so much from those tournaments. I learned, like we spoke before, the self-discipline, the you know, not having everything uh, all the time ready for you. You had to <laughs> grind, you had to fight, and 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 I think you know maybe it's a mistake that I I, I said those tournaments, but. <laughs> <laughs> but because I learned a lot from it, but uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's the way it is. And your favorite stop on tour doesn't have to be a grand slam. It could be anyway. It could be Monte Carlo. It could be anyway. Uh, I would <laughs> Sydney, Sydney, mm -hmm. beautiful the tournament, place. Sydney. Yeah. Uh, I think it's place. a beautiful place, beautiful city. That's where I met my wife. Uh, so yeah, I would go with <laughs> Sydney. <laughs> Australian summer is a good time. Yeah. So, so last question. You had Australian Open. Uh, I think you have two sets to love on Roger Federer. One right? set to love. One set to love on Roger Federer. And right? a break. That, that was and a break, right? A set and a break, right? I and double break said, point. Oh, <laughs> a set yeah. and a break and a double break point. Yeah. Somebody's gonna tie. I'm surprised that of all the coaches and players, nobody's written a book called A Set and a Break. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because if you think about the number of matches, you up a set and a break and it just goes the other way. So tell me about that match, for both emotionally, right, in the match, and then after, right? Because I think you talk about some of these junior tournaments, right? And I always look for 
like now as a coach, I look at these girls, right? And they can all hit the ball. They can all move. They're great athletes. They're all like doing the right. But some of them can't finish, right? And so when I look at coach, I look at these 12-year-olds. I'm looking, okay, who can finish, right? You know what I mean? Um, tell me about that match, right? Because I remember that match and I was like, oh, that's a tough. He's going to remember that match for the rest of his life. And I did. And I do still, you know, and uh, it pops, you know, always there was, uh, I could have won that match, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, to start with, with that match, you know, I, I had a great plan in place uh, with my coach, uh, you know, to, to aggress Roger every second serve to, to be very aggressive and, um, and yeah, take risk because I played him two weeks, uh, three weeks before in Doha and I lost 6-4, 6-4. And I remember I came out of the court again, the learning process and, and, and to, told my coach, you know, next time I play him, I would, you know, aggress his second serve like crazy, uh, aggress his backhand and move him all the court. Don't give him any rhythm, like be so aggressive, backhand, forehand down the lines. And, and that's what I did for a set and a half. I mean, set and a half. And then... And then emotions hit me. Emotions hit me. I, I remember the moment. Uh, it was uh, 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 seven five for me, or six four, seven five or six four for me first set. I was a, I was a break up in the second. He broke me back. Okay, everything was under control. And then at six five for him in the second set, I was serving, go forty love up, going into the tie break. And that's where I start thinking like if I go to the tie break because I was winning my service games easy and you know he was struggling a bit uh, you know I'm, I'm two sets to love up and I start thinking about the future I start thinking about you know I'm there and all of a sudden I hit three double faults one 404 error and all of a sudden he breaks me and he's seven five up in the second I mean we're once at all and from then onwards everything everything came out all the energy all the adrenaline I, I even start cramping on the calves you know I, I i don't know something happened emotionally and and yeah i was just inexperience in not uh, not ready for the moment maybe or i don't know too emotional uh, <laughs> something happened there and and the, the thing is when you start thinking in these big moments or any match if you start thinking future and you're not at the moment you're not at the present time it slips, I mean, you know, it slips away so fast that you cannot control it. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. But that's why you're the perfect person to do what you're doing now, ushering the next generation into this sport, right? And identifying them young. Um, one of the things I would like to see in the U.S. is more of what you're doing, right? The IMG, the future stars. How do we get one of those here? Because I feel like we have, you know, USTA, 12 and under, 16 and under, 18 and under. And these kids in the States, they think they're so good until they go overseas. You know what it's I mean? In, it's like it's, small it's in every country. It's in yeah. every country. It's yeah. in every country. Yeah. So we, we need you to bring this event to Chicago. And we'll okay. find every good 12-year-old and bring them. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because I think exposure, right? You talk about you being on a small island and getting out and seeing the big world, right? It's just, you know, getting exposure to bring us kids. But I would love to have you bring that event to Chicago uh, so we can get some of these 12-year-olds who don't even know about this event. I mean, there's so many people who don't even know about this. Now, how did you all pick the kids? Yeah, I mean, it's it was IMG. They they have a committee where, you know, they they all all, all the kids can send videos to, to, to IMG. And uh, IMG has a committee where they, they choose the best, which what they think the scouts and the committee and the ex-coaches, they, they, they choose the best videos and they invite the kids over uh, to this event. It's 24 uh, boys and 24 girls under uh, the ages of 11 and 12 years old, under 12. And uh, yeah, they, I mean, they're, they're, once they get into in, in, in Athens, everything is covered for them. Uh, uh, hotels, accommodation, uh, food, uh, and uh, you know they have some fun activities. There, there is um, a, how you say, like an exhibition match between Alcaraz and and um, oh. uh, Hurzak. Uh, there is non-tennis activities also, like uh, night movies, 
uh, treasure hunts. Uh, there, I mean, you know, and, and, and there is always like, I mean, there is also some workshops about, with uh, famous coaches that come and do some workshops. So, you know, we, they interact with, with not only the, 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 the tennis players, but also the, their team, their parents, you know, to, to, to gu- kind of guide them to, to the, um, uh, guide these kids and, and, their, and their teams uh, in, into the professional sports of tennis. And, uh, and yeah, there, there, is a, there is a lot of, of, of things outside the tennis court that will help, you know, ev- every single one of the persons that are there to, to have an understanding of, of you know, what's, what's going on in the, in, the, in the professional world. Well, man, it's been great having you on. I appreciate the time. Um, I want to wish you luck with the event. I think it's what tennis, you know, tennis continues to innovate and try to find ways to grow the sport and like make it bigger and better like basketball and soccer and that kind of thing. So, you know, you've been a gift to the game on the court and now continue to be a gift to the game off the court. So I want to just take this opportunity to, to say, I appreciate you. I enjoy watching you. I, 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 I used to love the long hair, even though I never had any. Right? <laughs> <laughs> why, why don't you try the beard? Oh, I'm trying, man. It's like, you know, I'm trying, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, man, I, I hope to see you soon, brother. I want to wish you luck, man, and Thank all the you. best. You too, man. Take care, and I hope to see you soon somewhere. This has been the Tennis.com podcast with the legend Marcos Baghdadi. Thanks for listening. <laughs>